Hey there, everyone. Welcome to Connection Points. Pastor Dennis with you today, and today we're going to pick up our study in John chapter 11, and we're going to finish up the chapter today uh, just with some uh, a couple of, couple of paragraphs here to finish it up. We've been talking about where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and how the Pharisees and the, and the, the chief priests came together in the Sanhedrin, and they're conspiring against Jesus to figure out how to get rid of him, how to how to put him uh, out of the picture because too many people are beginning to follow him and they're concerned that this is going to get the attention of the Romans and it's going to create problems for them and it's going to cause them to lose their power and authority in in the culture and they're they're ignoring completely the power of God. They're completely ignoring the the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. I mean, he's just raised Lazarus from the dead. They've seen him. They've seen him um, give people their sight back. They've seen him heal lame people that could not walk for decades. Um, they've seen incredible things, but still, they're blinded by their own selfish ambitions, and and it's threatening their way of life and. You know, I think sometimes that's the lesson that we need to understand if we're going to come to Christ is Jesus said it himself. He never watered this down. He said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to lay down your life and take up the life that I have for you. Here's the key to that, though. The life that he has for us is always better than the one we laid down. No matter how good you might think it it might be, according to this world standards, when we have peace with God, nothing can compare with that. And so, these um, these folks are are concerned about losing their power, their and and their authority, and and all that they all that they have. So they come together to conspire to kill him. And one of their chief priests, Caiaphas, uh, stands up and basically prophesies what Jesus is going to do. Now. I don't think he had any idea what he was really talking about, what he was really saying. He was thinking on a political way that one person dying instead of dying on behalf of a nation to keep the Romans from coming in and destroying their whole nation. Uh, In other words, one person giving their life for that nation. What really he was talking about from God's perspective and, and in a prophetic way was Jesus dying for the whole world, that one man giving his life for all would, would restore all of humanity. And that's, that's really what Romans chapter 5 is all about, where he talks about Jesus, Jesus being the second Adam. Adam sinned and it destroyed all of humanity. It separated all of humanity from God uh, from that point forward. Jesus came and died for that sin and restored the connection that we have with, with God for all of humanity. So through one man we died, but also through one man we lived. Through Adam we died, through Jesus we lived. And so it's an important thought process and to understand to understand the the bigger scheme of the gospel here in verse 55 uh, 54 it says this therefore jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of judah instead he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to the uh, to the village called ephraim where he stayed with his disciples so jesus basically withdraws from public life at this point uh, in, into wilderness, and he goes basically into hiding um, with his disciples and spends time training and teaching them because we're going to see very soon when he reemerges, we're, we're, in the, we're in the time of the, resurre- the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, most of... About half of the Gospel of John covers uh, simply a couple of weeks or a week of uh, Jesus' life because he goes into depth into the whole uh, death, burial, and resurrection because that's the theme of the Christian life. That's the central point. That's the pinnacle moment 
of of humanity and of the gospels and and so John spends a lot of time in that and we're going to see that in verse 55 it says when it was almost time for the Jewish passover many went up went up to the went up from the country to Jerusalem for the ceremonial cleansing before the passover so they're observing the passover laws that Moses had passed down to them verse 56 they kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't, um, isn't he coming for the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. So the people are looking for him. The enemies of Jesus are waiting to arrest him. They're trying to shut him down. They're trying to close him off. And and ultimately, they want to kill him. And ultimately, they will. But in this moment, um, Jesus is, is isolated and away, and the people are looking for him. And this is a, this is a powerful imagery of the world that we really that we still live in to some degree is that when we look at the fact that that Jesus is there and if we feel like we can't find him we have to we have to think about okay what why am i looking why why do i need him why am i crying out to him and one of the great promises that comes after this that, that that Jesus will talk about and um, is is and it's really been a promise all the way through in the even in the Old Testament. God said, "If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. Then I will show up. Then I will make my I will reveal myself." He says in another place, "If you love me and seek me with all your heart." Then you will find me. You see, sometimes we need to we need to need God enough to work hard at seeking Him, to to put everything else aside, put everything else away, and not just come to God when it's convenient for us, but to come to Him because we are desperate and hungry and thirsty. And and one of the beatitudes, you know, blessed are the are the thirst the hungry and thirsty for they will be fed they will be satisfied they will be taken care of when we come hungry and thirsty that's when i think god really shows up strong and so i i, I would just invite you to to think about that where what areas do you really need god to show up in your life right now what are the areas that you're that you're just really hungry and thirsty? You're you're just really starving for a, a touch from heaven, a touch from God to to reach into your life and to make a difference. I, I would just say focus on that and lean into that because the enemy's out there trying to keep us separated, trying to shut Jesus down, trying to keep us from our hope and keep us from the answers that He has for us. But He's not going to win. He didn't win here. He's not going to win now. He's already been defeated. And it's in that defeat that we have our victory because we know that if we call upon his name, we will be saved. He will show up. And I don't mean that just, you know, just to be saved from from hell so that we go to heaven when we die. I mean, we will be saved in whatever circumstances we are in currently that Jesus can show up and make a difference, and he will. His promise is true. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this promise, this opportunity to see um, what it looks like to to need you and to want you and to be hungry and thirsty for you. And we just ask, God, that you would help us in in that moment of, of needing you to uh, set everything else aside and to focus in intently on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being with me, everybody. We'll see you soon.